Okay, today I want to talk about the data that Dr. Erickson, the ER doctor in California, used uh, influenza data and how that compares to the COVID-19 data. Here's one problem with it, and it's not an apples and apples comparison because all the numbers we see with influenza are including vaccination. And I've heard somewhere between 40 and 60% of the population don't get vaccinated. So we'll say only half the people get vaccinated. And even then the vaccines are not 100% effective. So they could be as low as maybe 20%. So if you have half the population vaccinated and a 10% efficacy on the vaccine, that's really only 10% of the population with immunity. So somewhere between 10% and 50% in any given flu year, the vaccine gives us immunity in the population and the immunity prevents it from spreading. Now the risk of COVID has not been the seriousness of the illness as much as the how rapidly it spreads. So the speed of transmission is so high, if only a small percentage of people need hospitalization, it can still overwhelm the healthcare system because we're a country of 330 million people. Okay, so speed of transmission was the main problem with this disease. Um, now, they don't ignore the, the seriousness of the illness, nor do they with influenza. But all the numbers we have with COVID-19 is with full mitigation. So other than healthcare workers, grocery store workers, the essential workers, so you probably have 80% of the people virtually immune because they're separate from everyone else. So you're really looking at mitigation being a much more effective, much more widespread form of vaccination than what you see with uh, influenza. So I think that makes it difficult to just look at the numbers for flu and extrapolate that over and say that they apply to the COVID. So if you see a low death rate with COVID and compare that to the flu death rate, well, COVID's no worse than the flu. I think that's an error in thinking because if they're the same, then because of the mitigation, COVID is much more serious than the flu if the numbers are the same. That's one of the problems I was having with all these numbers, data that he was throwing out. But I was really intrigued by the Norway-Sweden data because you have two very similar populations geographically close to one another. And Sweden is 10 million people. Norway's 5.4. Uh, Sweden is doing herd immunity, right? Isolate the sick people, the high-risk people, a form of herd immunity. And Norway's doing what we're doing, lockdown. Norway's 5.4 million people. Norway had a drastically lower death rate than Sweden. And his conclusion from the data was, well, they're both statistically insignificant, so who cares? I, you know, I, so I went back and I looked at it. There's more to be gleaned from it than statistically insignificant. So let's look at it. Norway doing mitigation, Sweden doing herd immunity. With 10 million population, they have 21% positive. They have, that extrapolates out to 2 million cases, 1,765 people dead. Norway, 4.9% positive. So it's only a quarter of the positive rate with 182 dead. On the surface, that's about a factor of 10, but Norway has a little more than half the population. So you're really looking at about a five-fold improvement in the number of deaths. You can definitely see the improvement from mitigation. His statement was they're both statistically insignificant. I see about a five times improvement in the death rate. Now, just for note, the Burke's Fauci models, the data initially presented, showed about a 10 times improvement, where 100,000 deaths, million deaths. So orders of magnitude, a factor of 10. I looked at that and thought, okay, how can we compare? Again, apples to apples is really hard to get to with these things. But, you know, how does this compare to the U.S.? So as of today, using his numbers, it was, so it was from a few days ago, they were at 1765. And if I normalize the... Norway death, their death rate would be 266. Assuming everything else is the same, which it's not, but 
mitigation, no mitigation, you have 1,765 deaths versus 266. So how's that compare to the U.S.? So I looked at the states with around about 10 million population. I looked at about 9 million to 11, maybe close to 12, and look at where our deaths stand between this 266 and 1,765. So if this calculation is only showing the effect of mitigation, then we should see around about 266 deaths in all these states. North Carolina, 10 million population, 289. Okay, pretty good, right? Following Norway. Ohio. Wow, Ohio has a lot more deaths. So, I don't know. Wonder, why would Ohio be so much higher than Norway if all other things are equal? Georgia, 904. Now Georgia is actually opening back up again. Pennsylvania, 1,537. So there's a lot of difference between these states all doing the same thing and the number of deaths. Illinois. Illinois is like a hot spot, supposedly, but it's not too far away from PA. Michigan. Michigan, 3,274 deaths. New Jersey, 5,863. <laughs> Can you do apples and apples with this? What is going on here? We're seeing a range of 289 to almost 6,000 deaths, and that's just so far. That's just to date. It's not over yet. So what does this tell us about mitigation? I would encourage you to think about it, and I'm just going to, off the cuff here, give you some of my thoughts. What this tells me, probably, is where the virus maybe appeared earlier. If you watch the Fauci and Burks, what they were telling us early on, and I did a video on that, that they weren't wrong. They talked about the importance of early mitigation. So the earlier you are in the mitigation, the closer to containment you are than actual mitigation. What I think this is telling us is Michigan, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, Illinois around Chicago, right? The travel places, major airports. That's where the virus started first. That's where the hotspots are. That's where the numbers are the highest. Dr. Burks and Fauci told us the reason they were not holding to the 100,000 deaths as a minimum. They never said that was a minimum. They actually said it was not a minimum. That's just what the model said. They believed in the states that were not in the hotspots that we could push the numbers way down, way down. That's exactly what we're seeing here. That's exactly what's happening here. Now the question becomes, you wanna open it back up? Well, if you look at the, how quickly it spread in New Jersey, Michigan, New York, versus some of these other states, if we're not careful about how we open it back up, couldn't it just happen? If we hadn't mitigated when we did, would the other states have gotten much higher numbers? They, they would have. I mean, they probably would have. So we can't forget this stuff. Look at the drastic difference in the numbers here. And that's just a matter of timing. That's really what this is. You can't draw the conclusion looking at numbers of positives and numbers of deaths with full mitigation compared to the number of positives and the number of deaths with influenza and say, well, it's just another flu. Let's just, you know, open it back up. We, you know, we did the right thing to begin with, but now it's nothing, but it's just like influenza. So let's open it back up. The numbers aren't showing that. Okay. It's because of the mitigation. Now, when this is all over, we need to do a post-mortem, a scientific ex exploration of the virus. We need to learn much more about the virus. We need data from immunity testing and things like that. And then we can make much more educated assessments of what happened. But right now, if we just go by what we're seeing, to now say this is a nothing burger, this is just another flu, I don't think that data bears that out. The economy being closed is not something to ignore. We can't just pick one over the other. But if we open this back up and then suddenly we spike around the country, what are we going to do then? Are we going to shut down again? What's that going to do to our economy? I don't think the American people will take another shutdown. Tom Wolf is a Democrat. Donald Trump is a Republican. The federal guidelines comes from a Republican administration. If you're a Democrat, the party doesn't want you saying anything positive or doing or saying anything that's going to make a Republican look good. Uh, the party has a lot of control over these officials. So reason I say this, when I look at the governor of Pennsylvania's going back to work plan, it's 
80, 90 percent exactly what the federal guideline was, which is fine. But it's totally rebranded. There's no mention of the federal guideline. Instead of phase one, phase two, phase three, they have red, yellow, green. So the whole thing's been branded to say this is the governor's plan. Nothing. There's no mention of the federal guideline whatsoever. In a way, the Democrats, if this goes well, our Democrat governor wants to take credit for that. They don't want any credit to go to Washington. They want the credit to stay with the Democrat Party and with the governor of Pennsylvania. But everybody does risk management. So what happens? He's, he's branded it. He owns it. He's taking all the responsibility. He's not deflecting any. What happens if we go back and there's a spike? What happens if the go-to-work plan doesn't work out? He can't point back to the administration because the whole rollout is branded by him. And it even has some of the Democrat Party items in there, like higher minimum wage and things, like that, which really should have nothing to do with this. But So politics is playing a part in this. Individuals managing their own risk is affecting, I believe, our timing of when Pennsylvania goes back to work. When they measure the economy versus the health, the risk of a second wave, because the governor's Democrat and because he's branded it all to be his decision, I think his risk tolerance for a second outbreak is very, very low. We're facing a higher damage to the economy for that reason. So they're going to keep selling and selling the danger, the health risk, the health risk. Again, it's not an either or. It's both. I think the wrong approach is just to say, hey, it was all wrong. The models were wrong. The estimate. Now we have the real data in flus and we can compare it. So let's just go back to work. No, that's stupid because that will waste the investment that we made. But it's legitimate to say, come on, why are we waiting till May 8th or after when Western Pennsylvania is clearly going to be ready the end of April? Now, by clearly ready, they have to have the testing infrastructure and, and some of the gating factors in place. But in terms of the curve, in terms of the number of cases, most of Pennsylvania, with the exception of the Philadelphia area, it looks to me like should be ready to go. And if it's not ready to go because of testing, we may not even be told that. Why? Because who's responsible for it? The governor. So if they say, yeah, we're ready, numbers look good, everything else, but we just can't get this testing thing figured out. We just don't have enough supplies. You're basically telling the people that I can't get this testing problem solved, so therefore you can't go back to work. We're probably not going to hear that either. Politics is definitely in this. But please be informed. Please use real numbers. Real Don't approach the data and the numbers with your agenda in mind. Don't spin and interpret and push out numbers in a way that supports your side when it distorts the numbers themselves. And I'm sorry, but I think Dr. Erickson's doing that on some extent. I think he's also not aware of what the federal government has been saying, nor is he aware of the go back to work strategy or guideline. He's probably getting all of his information from the media. Not a good place to go. I've done videos about the model, Dr. Burks, Fauci, and I explain all that to you, that the media has not been asking good questions and their reporting has been terrible. We can't treat this as a nothing burger. We have to be very careful when we go back. The federal guideline is solid. I think it gives us a way to continue to contain the virus. And for people that are on that extreme, as if not wearing masks and just wanting to go back to work and considering this some kind of conspiracy theory, they are wrong. For the people that are terribly afraid and kind of want to do the stay at home almost forever, they're wrong too. And why are they wrong? Because they wouldn't even be afraid if it wasn't for Dr. Barks and Fauci. Everything that they know about mitigation, protecting yourself, stay at home, came from Burks and Fauci, and Burks and Fauci are now telling us it's okay to go back. Follow these guidelines. Unless you're telling me you know better than they do, then it's okay. Don't be afraid. Follow the guidelines. We're going to go back to work. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks for viewing. Give me a like if you liked it. Subscribe, share, and God bless.